hello and welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. And we'd like to wish a blessed Yom Kippur to those who are observing today. I'm Mindy Wright, a member of CMC's Board of Trustees and Director of the Nonprofit Higher Ed Alliance. I'm really happy to see everybody here today. Today, CMC is brought to us with the support from, of the Greater Columbus Arts Council and Puffin Foundation West, both of whom have many friends and associates in the audience. Please help me thank them. It's an honor today for us to hear from an extraordinary hometown talent, a man who has given voice to storied heroes of our civil rights past and connected them to current events and the enduring struggles of today. It is our shared history and no one tells this, these stories better. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome best-selling author, prize-winning journalist, acclaimed biographer, and cultural historian, Will Haygood. Joining Will on stage today is another hometown talent and treasure. Please welcome Will's friend and our friend, Larry James. <laughs> Gentlemen, the stage is yours. All right. Uh, last night I had the pleasure of introducing Will, and I did it something like this. I, there are two introductions that need no introductions. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Rolling Stones. Ladies and gentlemen, Will Haygood. <laughs> um, Vanity Affair, there's another book that Will has authored. Um, it's a book that he's done for the Columbus Museum of Art. Vanity Affair has listed that book as one of the 10 top art books of the year. And I quote, there have been few moments in history of art and letters as profound and enduring as the Harlem Renaissance, Renaissance, which became the first collective salvo in the history of America to herald black experience. Cataloging the paintings, the photography, the contemporary documents and other phenomenon from the era, Haygood, preeminent historian on Harlem and its roots, bring the movement which marks its centennial, centennial this year to life, celebrating the black artists who lit the torch. Haygood writes, the men and women who made art, art that was so often so potent, it forced America to take notice. Will, how did it come about? Why did you do it? And um, just take us through that journey of... <coughs> Uh, well, um, I um, had written this book about Thurgood Marshall called Showdown, and I was I was given a talk at the Lincoln Theater, um, and uh, and Nanette Macy Jones, CEO of the museum and Bill Connor and you had a meeting of the minds and said, well, wow, Will has written several biographies about major American figures who have cross, crisscross into the realm of the Harlem Renaissance. And that would be Sugar Ray Robinson and Adam Clayton Powell, Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, there's another one who I'm leaving out. Sugar Ray, Sammy Davis, Adam Powell, and Thurgood, and Thurgood Marshall, all were either touched or were greatly influenced uh, by the Harlem Renaissance. And so, um, and also, especially with the Adam Clayton Powell book, I, uh, he was married to Hazel Scott, who was a jazz pianist who was around during the Harlem Renaissance. And so, uh, uh, to unravel her life, um, I flew to Paris. Had to go to Paris. <laughs> it was April. <laughs> I just made sure that my publisher knew that I couldn't finish this book unless I went to Paris in April. <laughs> and over there, I was able to track down some of the Harlem artists who had worked with Hazel Scott, and that was really amazing. And then, 
And then I was at the Boston Globe when that book was finished, and I came up with an idea to write a three-part series on uh, some of the figures uh, who were still around from the Harlem Renaissance, and this, and this was in the mid-'80s when I wrote that three-part series. So then to be approached by the museum uh, to curate this show seemed like a dream come true and because it really utilized a lot of things that I uh, felt very passionately about, art, artist, music, pictures. So, so Will, this is the book. It is um, a final product, but Will, talk to us about, you, you had not curated before. What did you do? How did you get the interest to find the pieces to suggest to Nanette to put in this exhibition that's coming in October? Mm -hmm. Well, being a newspaper man, I'm, I'm pretty savvy at calling experts and asking them their advice. So I would call somebody in Chicago or St. Louis who worked in a museum setting and I would say, hey, hey Fred, this is Will. I've got myself in a pickle. I told some people that I knew how to curate a museum <laughs> exhibit show, and you know, I feel that my back is really up against the wall, and I don't want to make a fool of myself, so send me some things, some notes, and what I should look for as I'm traveling around the country. And they were kind enough to do it. And then from there, actually, you know, there's a great museum staff, they help. And you know, from there, it was just uh, my talent that kicked in, my eye that kicked in, you know, and if I would be at the Smithsonian looking at 50 prints of something, you know, this looks good and I want this. I don't want that, I don't want that, I want that, that looks good. And it just sort of <laughs> built up. I mean, it, really just took on a life of its own. You will find that the exhibit is gonna be heavy on writers because I'm a writer, you know? So that's okay, you know? Langston uses, he's in the exhibit. When I was a kid, I used to go to the Columbus Public Library downtown and I would read about Langston Hughes and he became one of my heroes. And, and then there's Mr. Chester Himes, who was an involuntary guest at the Ohio State Penitentiary. Um, and while he was in prison, he wrote some of the Harlem artists, letting them know that he wanted to become a writer. Uh, and so um, I won't say that, you know, I learned as I went. I did learn as I went about this process, but there was also a whole lot that was built up inside of me already about art and about uh, Harlem. Uh, in the book I wrote, it's really a nonfiction sweeping saga about the Harlem Renaissance. I did not want to write the kind of book where you go to the museum and then you'd see some writing on the wall about about the picture and then you look in the book and you see that same writing in the book. I did not want to waste the reader's time that way and so I did what I do best which is tell stories. So I selected the artists that I like and wrote stories about them, about their lives, you know, their life, their journey, many biographies. Um, I think that's what really makes this uh, book um, um, if I may humbly say, uh, rich. Um, it is not a museum catalog, it is a real book. Thank you. You've been a part of this whole Harlem Renaissance movement that we put forth here in Columbus. Um, and when you look at this movement and you look at what the museum's done and you look at this publication, what do you hope people take away from it? You once said, as you were growing up, if I can get to the library, I can get to South Africa, I can get to Paris, I can get to London. 
What do you hope people take away from these writings and these experiences? Yeah. Um, we're in a tough moment in this country right now when it comes to race. There's no doubt about it. We are stopping brown kids at the border. If those kids were blind, blue-eyed, uh, we would not be locking them up and separating them from their families. <clears throat> and I think what the artist did in the 20s and 30s and 40s is that they were not afraid to speak out. Uh, they let their art uh, speak for them. Um, <coughs> Let their poetry speak for them. And the title of this book is I Too Sing America. So just think of those little kids locked up in a cage is what they're trying to say to the world. You know, I'm with my mother and where my mother goes, I go. So I too now sing America. Even if they weren't born here, they're with their mother. And you know, we really, I think, um, uh, lost our way in that sense, and that we aren't looking at uh, you know what the Statue of Liberty really, really meant. You know, it's like a us versus them. You know, and if it's a child who's trying to speak to the rest of the world, and and they can't find their mother, and that's heartbreaking. You know, there are, you know, more people not in the arts than there are people in the arts. And so that small clique of artists, writers or painters or singers, you know, they feel that they have an extra duty, and I think that's what the Harlem Renaissance, you know, it wasn't really when it started a, a renaissance because nothing had come before it. It was an original, uh, astonishing movement that woke this nation up. Okay. When you, um, shifting gears to Tigerland, um, what do you see along those same lines as the importance or significance of this book at this time about an all-black high school on the east side of Columbus and you writing it at this juncture? Yeah. Um, this is a book about a high school segregated um, in 1968. That summer, of course, it was very painful in this country. We had lost both uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert F. Kennedy, and um, and people were heartbroken. Um, and Jack Gibbs, the first African American principal of a high school in this city, looked at his student body and said, "Look." We can rebel out of anger, we can walk out, we can protest, or we can knuckle down and try to do something special. Uh, and they started winning on the basketball team, and they reached the tournament, and they played a team, uh, Toledo Libby, and they were up by one point, and Toledo Libby had the ball with seven seconds, and they're dribbling down the court, getting ready to get ready to set the final play up. And the Libby player shoots, and the ball hangs on the rim, like you know, <laughs> three seconds. You know, the ball just hangs on the rim, and I was in Toledo about eight months ago. And there was a big audience much like this, and I said, one of the reasons I've come here is to thank the Toledo Libby players <laughs> for losing that game, <laughs> and because history would have been different and I might not be working on this book. <laughs> I don't know how many Toledo Libby players in the audience like that, but um, they won that game uh, just by one point, and then they went on to the state tournament, and they won that. And then 55 days later, the underdog, Ragtag East High School baseball team uh, went to the uh, state championship game, 
uh, and they won that by one run. You know, you know these great sports movies that we see that involve race, like uh, uh, Remember the Titans and Friday Night Lights and Blindside and and Hoosiers. In a way, um, uh, these are all stories that we are very fascinated by because we live in a sports mad nation, uh, and and yet this story got lost. I mean, you know, nobody wrote about it, nobody cared about it. Ten years on, twenty years on, thirty years on. Now it's fifty years on, and here's what happened: uh, four years ago, after I finished Showdown. You know, it takes like a year, you know, from when you hand a book in to when it starts showing up at the Barnes and Noble. And um, uh, so I'm on the phone with my editor after I finish Showdown, and he says, so Will, I have your manuscript, I went through it, and I want to say, it's flawless, ain't it? You know, there's nothing for you to do, right? I mean, you know, I'm about to put you out of business, right? <laughs> You know, and of course, you know, that really wasn't the case. I get it back and it looked like somebody spilled blood on it. It's got all these <laughs> red marks, you know, and I'm mad at my editor for like a week, you know. How dare him? But, you know, I could tell that he still loved me because he said, okay, what next? What do you want to do next? Which is always music to a writer's ears. Uh, so I said, well, uh, there are two ideas, Peter, that I'm thinking about, and I'm thinking about one about the movies in American history and certain movies and how those movies can tell the story of the country. And he said, mm-hmm, oh, okay, okay. And he said, and your second idea, what's that? <laughs> And I said, uh, well, you know, there's this school in my hometown I'm kind of thinking about. I, I said it was all black school and the school doors opened in 1968. King and Kennedy had been assassinated and, and the team uh, won the state basketball tournament. Eight of the 12 mothers of the players worked as maids in the city, and then the day after basketball season ended, and then they start the baseball season, and they have mismatched uniforms. They don't have a dugout. They sit on folding chairs, and they reach the state tournament, and they win eight straight games during the season. They had lost, they had a five game losing streak, but now they're in the tournament and they win eight straight games. And also, the school sent more uh, students to college that year than ever before. Uh, and my editor said, uh, when are you starting on that book? <laughs> And so I, I said, wow, Peter, it is a book to you? And he said, uh, Will, yes. And so I said, well, I'll start working on my usual 20-page book proposal tonight. And he said, uh, Will, I don't need a proposal. Just start on the book. And so I did. And now here the book is. So. Um What were the benefits of uh, a segregated East High with a principal like Jack Gibbs and what he meant and how he went about transforming the school? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, school teachers in this city who were black were, you know, I mean, recent college graduates who wanted to uh, teach. Uh, they were directed toward Champion Junior High or East High School. Black teachers were. Uh, it wasn't right, of course, but that's the way it was. And so uh, at East, you would have the best of the best, the cream of the crop, a teacher who couldn't get a job at West, but maybe they were a mighty fine chemist or a mighty fine mathematician. But West didn't want them, North didn't want them, but South didn't want them, so they landed at East. Uh, and so uh, that is what that world 
of segregation <laughs> created. Everybody had to live within it, yes, but they also had to rise within it, and they did to show the world. And Jack Gibbs was passed over twice to become the principal at East High School by two white men. Uh, he almost left the second time. He was so heartbroken. But his wife told him to stick it out, and he did. And on the third time, get this, on the third time, Jack Gibbs had played football at Ohio State. And, and he came off the bench in the Michigan game and got an interception, and they went on to win the game. And he became, he was a walk on football player. He became an instant legend in 1954, Jack Gibbs. So when his coach, Woody Hayes, heard that he was going to quite possibly be turned down a third time for the top job at East High School, Woody, bless his heart, went over to the school board and said, put my man in that job. <laughs> he deserves it. I want, I want you to talk about, there is a scene in the book, um, Eddie, they won the second year basketball state championship, and Eddie Ratliff grabs the players and says, go find your mothers. Talk about the mothers and uh, their importance. Yeah, most of these mothers now um, uh, were born in the South. And so uh, all of them actually, uh, nine, nine of the 12 mothers on the basketball team, uh, who had sons on the basketball team, were born in the South. And, and they were uh, 10, 12, 13, 14 year old girls when Emmett Till was murdered in 1955 for whistling at a white woman in Money, Mississippi. So these women uh, were happy to flee the South. They were happy uh, and to land up North. Better opportunities. Uh, and uh, one of the mothers who just uh, she touches my heart to this day. Lucy Lamar uh, uh, from North Carolina um, um, in, no, Georgia, and uh, uh, her husband uh, uh, stayed down south, um, and so she was a single mother, uh, and she suffered terrible migraine headaches, terrible migraine headaches. And she hopped on the bus every day and she rode the bus to Bexley, where she worked as a maid. So one day, her son and Dwight Lamar came home and said, Mama, the coach at North High said I have to cut my afro, you know. And that was a point of pride, you know, that was a point of cultural pride to have a nice afro. And, you know, he said, Mama, I just don't want to cut my afro. And his mother, Lucy Lamar, a maid, who the only thing she could do to help her family was hop on a train, a one-way ticket, and take her and her three sons north. So at least Lucy Lamar looked at her son and said, I did not leave the South for you and our culture to be disrespected. And she said, uh, son, if you want to keep your afro, uh, your mama is going to stand with you. So Dwight Lamar, who we, all, who we were all with last night, um, went to the coach, who was white at North High School, and said, sir, my mama said I don't have to cut my afro. <laughs> uh, no, you know. And that's not going to work in my family. You know, she doesn't want me to cut my afro. And the coach told and Dwight Lamar, who was the leading scorer in the city, you're kicked off the team. And I'm, I'm sorry. You know, there are a lot of parents around the school uh, who think that that afro represents some form of militancy, militancy in black power. And so a week later, a week later, look at the symmetry of this book, please. A week later, Jack Gibbs and Doc Simpson 
at East High School go to visit in Dwight Lamar. And they say, hey, uh, now, uh, we heard about what happened, you know, and you're going into your summer. We don't know, you know, what you'll do, but you're a very gifted, very gifted basketball player. And if you, if your mother should happen to move to the east side, uh, you know, into Poindexter Village where the rents are very low, um, you would certainly be welcome at East High School. And uh, now, in those days, uh, no school principal or school teacher wanted to be charged with tampering, so they could just mention it. If you would like to think about it, we're there for you. And so, and Dwight Lamar, mother, had an uncle who lived on the east side in Pondexter Village. And so that's where they moved. And, and Dwight Lamar uh, was the missing link almost that year. And uh, he uh, went to southwestern Louisiana. Now, get this. North did not want him. And he became a first-team college All-American. In, in, in 1974, the five first-team college All-Americans were David Thompson of North Carolina State, Doug Collins of Illinois State, Bill Walton of UCLA, Eddie Ratliff, Long Beach State via Columbus East, Dwight Bo Pete Lamar, University of Southwestern Louisiana, Via, via Columbus East. I got one more question because we'll have to get to uh, <laughs> questions here in a bit. But you know, last night we hosted many of the families and the players. What did you take away from the gathering? What would one uh, see and embrace from the gathering last night? And so before that, if you have questions, why don't you go to the mic this time as Will finishes this question. Um, last night that those men coming together and families. They too, in their own collective way, sang America. Just like in the Harlem Renaissance book, I too sing America. They had white coaches and white teachers who loved them, who would reach in their pockets and do anything for them. And, and, and some of those people uh, were there last night. And you could just sense the love, and you could just sense how their how their, you know, their beautiful pride, their cultural pride in who they are. And this nation tries to rob black people of dignity so often. Look at the man in the White House attacking black athletes because they want social justice. That is as wrong as the day is long. And you know, it just is. That's just wrong. Thank you. A um, couple of uh, comments. Uh, we'll move into the audience. Um, it is a tradition to take questions. We hope they're not speaking questions, narratives, but they are in fact questions. Otherwise, we will cut you off. <laughs> and we're, I've given you two extra minutes to go to questions. So, John? John Brody, thank you. The, please feel free to refashion this question however you wish. You travel a lot, you've seen a lot of Columbus, you've seen a lot of the, the country. How is Columbus doing compared to its past, compared to other cities, compared to your experiences? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, these people who are speeding around on these scooters, like, you know, you know, like moving, walking dead. <laughs> no, you know, it, it's, it, you know, it, it's like a shock to my system, like, man, what are you doing? You're out in the middle of the street, move, man. You know, whose idea was that? I mean, you know, God, it, it's, 
it's like, man, you know, I, 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 I'm sick of them already. I see them out the rearview mirror. It's one over there, and then, and, and then they're laying down like they had a heart attack, you know, like little ugly bikes. I mean, so that, I'm sorry to go off on a tangent. Maybe I'll tell Mayor, get there. I'm going to see him tonight. Hey, Mayor, come here. You know, but, you know, there's a lot that I think is, you know, wonderful about the city, uh, uh, you know, that has improved since when I was a little kid. You know, there was no Mayor Michael Coleman when I was a little kid. There was no Larry James when I was a little kid, you know. There was no Angela Pace when I was a little kid, you know. And so, you know, a lot about the city has improved. But that the state voted for this nut in the White House, it, it just baffles, baffles my mind. I'll quote the former president, Obama, who has said, we've seen too much craziness already. I mean, it's, it's scary to wake up every day. So I hope that Ohio gets its political act together for the midterms. I really do. Franklin County has always led the way, though, you know, as far as sanity at the polls. Very proud of Franklin County. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Tony Teague Bell, and I don't know if you remember me well. I do, but Tony, we, hi. Yeah, thank you. So um, I'm going to try hard not to cry because your book, Showdown, really inspired me to dig deep and think about what real sacrifices Thurgood Marshall and people like him really made and the risks that they took for freedom and the and dignity and the right to be treated as equals in this country. And all of your writing is inspiring to me, but the interesting question I have is, how in the world do you do all this research and tell such a glorious story? I mean, I do laugh and cry, and then I have to go look up legal briefs, um, you know, um, just to make sure I understand the fullness of what you did, but I think I remember you saying you you research and, and you write for a good 10, 12 hours a day, but how do you not get stuck and how do you not get angry? How do you manage to tell such stories of hope um, so that, you know, people want to keep reading? Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Tony. How do I not get stuck? It's called being on deadline and not having a steady paycheck coming in. <laughs> you know, that helps. You know, I just can't afford to get stuck. Uh, you know, I just can't afford that. Um, uh, you know, is what I do is look for these, you know, stories, you know, and that people haven't told before. I think that's why I had this idea to go find this butler. You know, and, you know, these are really universal stories, you know, and that people can snatch and hold on to. I mean, uh, and too, I tend to write books about people who I look up to, you know, for some strange reason, you know, I'm not going to write a whole 450-page book about a villain. I just don't want to live with a villain for four years. I just don't. Somebody once asked me, you know, how do I choose a subject? And usually, I will have two people sort of sitting on the couch, and I'll think of myself walking down the hallway, opening my door for four years every night, and can I smile when I look at that person on the couch? And I remember when I was uh, thinking about my book about Sammy Davis Jr., and I was also thinking about 
Nelson Rockefeller, great liberal governor out of New York City. And then I said to myself, hmm, I'm walking down the hallway, I'm unlocking my door, and I open it, and there's Nelson Rockefeller sitting next to Sammy Davis Jr. <laughs> Who do I want to hang out with? <laughs> And you know, and so nothing against Nelson Rockefeller, but Sammy, Sammy just seemed a little more hip. Yes, yes, next. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Grace Hunter, um, City of Columbus Mayor's Office. I'm a proud graduate of East High School, class of 99, and I'm also the daughter of the late Dean Francis, who was class of 69, and he was head of the drum line. Yeah. Um, in your book, do you talk any about the music and just the overall culture and pride within East High School? I mean, you, you are going to love this book. <laughs> To have asked me a question like that, I mean, oh, do I talk about the music? I mean, there's a scene in the book, and I'm going to tell you the scene. I shouldn't, but I'm going to tell it to you, where they're at a game, and, and they're quiet, and Jack Gibbs gets up, and he's going over to a student who has been yelling. And you, you know, has he been yelling too loud? Is Jack Gibbs angry? So Jack Gibbs picks up a bullhorn and everybody is nervous looking at him. And Jack Gibbs uh, hands the bullhorn to a student named Chris Dixon. And he says to Chris, it's time to do your thing. And Chris Dixon takes the bullhorn and he starts singing this epic East High fight song. I went down to the river, oh yeah. And I started to drown, oh yeah. I started thinking about them tigers, oh yeah. And I came back around, oh yeah. You're gonna love this book. I got that all throughout the book. Yes, yes ma'am. Good afternoon. I'm Deborah Aubert Thomas. I'm Vice President at Philanthropy Ohio, and I can't wait, wait to read the book and see the exhibit. And we're going to be hosting 150 institutional philanthropists from across the state in October at the museum for our welcome party so they can see this exhibit. So I'm excited about that. Oh, wow. Can you talk about um, connections to today's local artist community here in Columbus? And do you see using the arts for social justice as something that translates from the Harlem Renaissance to now? Yes, it has been thriving, you know, with Larry James in the entire museum has done in this moment, I think, is that they've lifted up these artists that, you know, they brought them out of the shadows. You know, a whole lot of people didn't know their names, didn't even know that they were here. And, uh, you know, they've been made to feel uh, welcome. They've, uh, and they've highlighted uh, their genius, be it in music, you know, slam poetry, music, dance, uh, you know, it's just been an astonishing revelation, I think, to various, various groups here in the city uh, uh, to see artists uh, uh, who haven't been recognized and who have the talent and the skills uh, to highlight the legacy of the Harlem Renaissance. It's just been a beautiful thing. It really has. It's just been astonishing. And I think this, what's going to happen in the fall, October, with this exhibit, I really think is going to be a, uh, a unique national moment in this country's fabric because this is an a epic uh, show. It is dazzling, um, and it really is going to be uh, unique. Heck, I'm getting fitted for my text now. <laughs> and let me just say this. I want to thank GCAC and Tom Katzmeyer and his team uh, and the overall uh, Columbus community. To date, we've raised $230,000 towards this effort. We have a uh, few more dollars to raise. It has been art extraordinary, and what Tom, Nanette, and I, and Susan Bradford at the Lincoln came up with is we are employing artists of color and they are being paid and their talents being showcased. Thank you. Uh, yes, my name is John McKnight. Um, 
my wife and I both grew up here in Columbus in more white neighborhoods. And from 79 to 82, she was bused and went to East High School. It was forced uh, desegregation busing. Neighborhood I lived in, I was not bused. And my observation, I don't know if it's correct, but it seems to be that my wife and her friends that, that were bused to East High School maybe are a little bit less prejudiced now than some of the friends that I grew up with that weren't bused. Now, Columbus City Schools stopped that busing program after several years, so I don't know if they thought it wasn't a good idea. Do you think that forced busing, the, the forced desegregation, uh, helped? Is it a good thing, bad thing? Just curious question. Yeah, me or Larry? You. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> That case, uh, you know, the school lawsuit, uh, that case that was filed here and it went and it went to the federal courts and then it was appealed all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. A lot of people don't know that. So East High School winds up, winds up at the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, uh, there's no doubt, I mean, I think that, as Thurgood Marshall told us, integration, uh, you know, it was the law of the land, school integration from 1954. The fact that cities and townships did not abide by that edict uh, uh, was unlawful. But I think there's a richness when blacks and whites and Asians uh, people from all races have an opportunity to have lunch together. Uh, Jack Gibbs had a program at East High School where he would reach out to a white, white suburban school. Northland High School was, uh, was the school that he started with. And he would have the student body come and visit East High School for a whole day. And then later that, uh, year, uh, East High School students would go visit Northland. So uh, I found out about that story when I was working on this book, when I was working on Tigerland. So I called um, a, a school principal at uh, Big Walnut High School uh, and I said, hey, I would like to uh, repeat this program that Jack Gibbs did. So I would like some of your students to come over and spend the day with e at, at, at East High School. Uh, and so uh, they're going to do that Friday. And some Big Walnut High School students are going to come over to East High School Friday. And I will be speaking to both groups. And I know somebody's going to get something rich out of that moment, I have no doubt about it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Keisha Gibbs and I'm the manager of the Martin Luther King Library. So I have the honor of seeing all of the great people that have come from East High School and the great students that attend there now. And I just wonder what role do you see this book playing for youth in our young minds and what things can we use it for, for the education system? Well, first of all, make sure that you have a whole lot of copies of Tigerland at the library. Don't or have check to worry it. about that one. Okay. Love you for saying that. Okay, I don't have to worry about that. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I, I ran into my, I ran into my dear friend Greg Dodd here. He's here. Ran into him in New Orleans. Uh, at the American Library Association, and I was down there talking about Tigerland. And I ran into him early one morning, like 7.15. I don't know what he was doing up that early, you know. <laughs> he was up to get breakfast, so was I, grits and bacon and eggs. And, and I remember one of the first things I said to him, now, have we got enough copies of Tigerland on order at the library? He said, don't worry about it, it's all taken care of. He's a man of his word, so I know it is. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, the thing that I love about uh, these two teams, basketball and the baseball team, champions, champions, is that they were champions before they picked up the basketball. 
or the baseball bat. They had some kind of moral, moral, moral direction that was inside of them, um, and you know it was just, it was just very beautiful that they knew to stick together. They didn't get in trouble. They stayed eligible. Um, you know, and so students who, or kids who are going to be coming through the library to read Tigerland will hear a story about kids just like them, 15, 16, 17 years old, uh, who uh, uh, had a purpose, who had a purpose. And sports was a way, if you're from a family that, and that doesn't have a lot of resources, sports is a way to get us you know, scholarship too, you know, and so you know, these players stuck together. They're all still friends. I really think, you know, all of these guys still love one another. Uh, that to me is, 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 is the real power of this story that yes, they were athletes, but they were also just good kids uh, who wanted to respect their community uh, and their elders, you know. And I really couldn't be more prouder as a writer to have given them a story to take with them now. Um, it's. What I do, and it's my Valentine to them and to the city. Thank you. One, next one. And while this next question is coming, today is also Will's birthday. Thank you, Mr. Haygood. Uh, my name is Eric Davies. I guess I'll start off by saying that I'm the proud parent of a senior at Miami University who is also studying as part of her degree journalism. So I hope oh. she gets a chance to hear you speak someday. Um, she's also a product of Columbus City Schools, which I'm very proud to say, and it also uh, breaks my heart to see the school ratings come out this week and see Columbus City Schools get an F and so many schools around us getting A's and B's and other communities. Yep. And so I'm wondering if your next book will be what Columbus City Schools and other urban districts can do to get an A, and knowing all the bias and the criteria itself in school ratings, but also just the poverty, the racism, and all the determinants of good education that we're facing and the many hurdles, and, and what your thoughts are as an educator and a, and a journalist. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think that, um, Yes, when I landed, I went over and picked up the newspaper, uh, which is now three dollars, three dollars for the dispatch. You know, I said, "Whoa, wow! Maybe this is a misprint." I had to go to the ATM. You know, I need some ones. God dog. I think my man Gary Kiefer is here, maybe. Oh, there he is. Hey, Gary, Gary. <laughs> He's a great journalist, Gary Kiefer. He's at the dispatch, but he can't make the $3 go away either, I don't think. But, um, you know, uh, schools are, you know, schools are just very, very important in our society. Teachers are very, very important. Libraries are very, very important. Um, I just don't know how to resolve, you know, all of the thickness that happens to be going on in the school system. I know one of the answers is not, not, N-O-T, not to arm teachers anywhere, <laughs> anywhere. Never. Yeah. I think with that, we're going to conclude the question and answer. <laughs> One more? One more? Okay. Thanks. Uh, Greg Brown with the Graham Family of Schools. Hi, Mary. Um, and I want to give you a birthday present, Will. 
you came and spoke to us at the Charles School a few years ago, right after the Butler, and yeah. you gave a wonderful, inspiring talk to our kids, all 400 of them. And it was at the Brentnell Gym. Yep, I remember. And at the end of it, you were egged on to take a 30-foot jump shot <laughs> in that auditorium. And you stood back, dribbled a few times, took a deep breath, shot that ball 30 feet. It hung in the air for about three seconds, <laughs> wondering whether it was going to, and it fell right through swished. Yep. And you got a standing ovation for that. And I want to know, is, I have two questions. Is that when you got inspired to write about East High School? <laughs> Because you were not far from it when you made that shot. And the second thing is, will you come back and talk to us at the school about this new book? Uh, uh, it's all you have to do is ask me. Will, will and you I'm come there. and talk to us? I will. Thank you. I'd there's, be honest. There's, a, there, there's one other thing I'd like to say before um, Mindy takes off, and that is, Nanette, uh, Mesa June, and Tom are spearheading an arts initiative to raise funds to support the arts so we're not collectively begging. So what you see this year in the richness of art, we can afford to put on arts education, inspirational programming, universal, irrespective of the zip code. On that note, thank you, speakers. I've been so looking forward to this forum, and I don't know about you, but it certainly dis didn't disappoint at all. Um, <laughs> let's go ahead and thank GCAC and Puffin Foundation West for their support today. <laughs> and our speakers, Will Haygood and Larry James. And thanks to all of you for being here. We hope to see you next week at 530. <laughs>